Welcome to the Zogby Report, our weekly podcast. For the first time in almost four years, um, my son Jeremy will not be joining me today. He is attending to the birth of my new grandchild, his son. And so he's got some other priorities to handle today. So I'm going to fly solo. We're going to do two things today. I want to talk about, first and foremost, what on earth is Vivek Ramaswamy doing? What's he trying to do? And then secondly, segue to something uh, much more popular and interesting, education savings accounts. And I have a guest, Joe Connor, founder of a company that helps states distribute these education savings accounts directly to parents. But let's go back to Vivek. Um, so, you know, this is a guy who, who was on the cover of Forbes magazine, Forbes 30 Under 30, uh, as one of the 30 exceptional young leaders to watch. Uh, he was on the cover. And so he's a whiz kid. He's a billionaire. He's very young, 38 years of age. And as we're learning, he's also very brash. He is the billionaire in the campaign and he's gone from being a blip to at least at one point measuring low double digits in the polls and a competitor but then since the GOP debates sans Trump have begun uh, we've seen Vivek's fortunes at least among Republican voters steadily decline in fact sink to the point where he's at about two or three percent nationally about four or five percent in um, in New Hampshire and in Iowa, but I think the most important thing is that with each debate, he emerges with higher negatives than when he came in. Um, he's very good at uh, alienating a good part of the audience. Uh, so he has carved out a position for himself as the young Trump, brash. Uh, into conspiracies, uh, not afraid to take on his opponents, and in fact, not only do it in a controversial way, but uh, some would argue, including me, in a, a, in a very inappropriate way. He's gone at their personhood. He's gone at their looks. He has gone after, in Nikki Haley's case, her family, her daughter, uh, to be specific. And in each case, he has gotten quite a few boos. In fact, he, he probably set a personal record for achieving boos in the Republican debate uh, that just aired uh, last Wednesday. So what's he doing? So I think we got a glimpse into that. You know, and initially we thought, 38 years old, um, if he doesn't really catch on, then he's auditioning for vice president. Hey, brash, shoots from the hip, uh, doesn't care what he says or who he hurts. Wow, who does that sound like? Sounds like he's the ideal running mate to, uh, to Papa Donald. Uh, on the other hand, uh, one of the rules in uh, selecting a vice president is you really don't want anybody who's going to be more controversial or uh, alienate more people or, biggest sin of all, get more publicity and be more charismatic than the guy at the top. Big mistake that John McCain made in choosing Sarah Palin. Got a big bump from Sarah Palin's announcement and, and in the first 72 hours. In fact, pulled very close to Barack Obama, who was at a, a personal high in the polls. And then the more Sarah Palin got publicity and sought publicity for the sake of getting publicity, we, we saw John McCain's fortunes with other factors go down the tubes. So I don't think that Donald Trump gives a second look at, at Vivek. We got a little bit of a clue in this last debate when really out of nowhere, he started talking conspiracy theories, conspiracy theories, incidentally, which have captivated a certain portion and not a small portion of re Republican voters. Uh, same kind of conspiracies that Donald Trump has even talked about or hinted at. So 
9-11 was an inside job. January 6th was an inside job. The great replacement theory, that's where the uh, liberals, progressives, led by none other than George Soros himself, uh, are plotting to move millions upon millions of non-whites into Western countries and either, quote, mongrelize or destroy both the bloodlines as well as the culture of the Western nations. Wow. So what's Vivek trying to do? Well, maybe try to carve out that constituency, but we get another hint because this week he had uh, on a podcast uh, Joe Rogan, famous for uh, uh, being the, maybe one of the chief conspiracy theorists out there. And Vivek has also praised Alex Jones, um, he who has been so outrageous as to suggest that the um, shootings at um, Sandy Hook, uh, this is just even too horrible to conjure, you know, were, were staged and the, that those victims and parents were all actors and uh, Alec Jones is going to be paying through his nose, I think, for the rest of his life. It looks to me like Vivek is moving from billionaire whiz kid to podcast host and carving for himself a future as a spokesman for conspiracies. And as you can see from Joe Rogan and from Alex Jones, there's big money in conspiracy theories. And so that's what on earth I think Vivek Ramaswamy is doing in this campaign. In this segment, what I'd like to do is introduce a client and someone who's going to be talking about something that perhaps none of you have heard of, education savings accounts. My guest will be Joe Connor, and we'll be back after a very short break. So as I just explained to you, I've got a special guest today. Uh, Joe Connor is the CEO and founder of Odyssey, uh, which helps states distribute what are known as education savings accounts directly to parents. Um, thus far, uh, $112 million worth of education savings accounts to 66,000 students. Very impressive. And so, Joe, welcome. It's, it's good to meet you. We did a very extensive poll for you in nine states. We're going to get into that in a few minutes. But first and foremost, let's explain to folks what are education savings accounts? Yeah, absolutely. First, I just want to say thrilled to be here, John, uh, and want to express my gratitude uh, for having me on the show and really looking forward to kind of diving in and discussing the poll that uh, we conducted in partnership with you. But to answer your question, education savings accounts are accounts that states set aside for money for parents to use on eligible K through 12 expenses. And I think a good analogy here are health savings accounts, which many of us mm -hmm. are familiar with. In that um, policy, essentially parents have access to an account and they can spend it on acceptable healthcare items. The big difference I would say between the two is in an HSA, it's you or I putting our own money into it. In an ESA, it's actually the state that's putting the funding into it. And then the parent can use it on really an expansive list of education items, everything from school tuition, to school supplies, things like notebooks, pens, pencils, technology items, so tablets or Chromebooks that could be useful for education, online classes. There's a whole host of services and products that could be used for the ESA. And I think the key portion of it is it really enables parents to have choice and a voice in education where they can pick what's best for their son or daughter. So in many states, there's been a, an explosion in poverty. I, I mean, you look particularly at school districts where it hits kids the worst. Alabama, 21 percent the kids in, in uh, Alabama schools in, in poverty, 17 percent in, in Pennsylvania. California, six in 10 students, K through 12, or what we call low income. So this is really a boon for, for parents, especially as we hit high poverty rates. But they're not just for 
poor students alone, are they, these ESAs? That's correct. So, you know, more student support is needed now than ever because childhood poverty is at record high. In addition to that, we're coming out of the last couple of years of COVID, which really disrupted for an entire generation of students their K through 12 learning experience, whether that was because they had hybrid class, their parents pulled them out of school, um, the schools were closed. There was kind of a whole host of reasons and pretty much every uh, standardized, nationally normed test that's out there has shown a marked decline uh, since COVID in student achievement. And so these programs really are important because they allow families to get flexible education funding and it allows them to quickly access that funding and utilize it in a way that can really help them either close a COVID learning gap that opened in the last couple of years or find a better high quality education because their local uh, district school isn't providing that. And so these are really, I think, kind of foundational for fixing and improving the current K through 12 education system. And as you said, these programs are now known as what is uh, universal which essentially means that although some of them have a preference for low income families, which means if there's more people who apply, the money is available. Someone with low income will get that preference over someone with a higher income. These programs are increasingly serving families really across income groups, across demographic lines. I mean, the programs are incredibly popular, especially in places like Iowa and Arizona and Florida, where we've seen just a huge demand for these types of policies. So I think what has intrigued me are a couple of things. Uh, first of all, the money is distributed directly to parents. And secondly, that as you've pointed out, uh, the, the needs are eclectic and the funding is flexible. So on one hand, you know, a lot of parents complain about supplies and backpacks and there are a bunch of charities, you know, here and there that supply those things. but Parents can directly uh, can use this money directly for those kinds of things, or to enter a charter school, uh, possibly, and, and pay some tuition. Or even, you know, if the school district has eliminated uh, band or the arts, and there's a program that's being in, that's involved that costs a few hundred dollars, the money could be used for that. I think that's what's really appealing is that it's in the, the the state is funding parents to make choices in their child's education, basically. A hundred percent. I think the really exciting thing and something that is novel with these policies is the idea that by giving parents uh, control over the funds, they can best decide where to spend it. And that includes out of school activities that are educational in nature. And so I think a great example is um, in Iowa, where we administer a program called the Students First program. There, every single parent gets $7,635 once they're deemed eligible for the program. The average private school tuition in Iowa is around 5000 And so that leaves essentially some leftover money, a few thousand dollars, for a lot of those parents to spend on a lot of the things that you know, me and yourself might take for granted for our kids, which is buying, you know, tutoring services outside if they're a little bit behind in math, or buying a Chromebook so that they can access online homework and access Khan Academy. And so I think that is really an incredibly powerful thing. And as a former teacher who taught um, in low income public charter schools, one of the things that was very difficult was we could only help the kids when they were in the classroom. And then once they went outside of that and, you know, they weren't necessarily maybe able to afford extracurriculars or sports or tutoring. And so this really is kind of a comprehensive policy that lets parents, you know, pick a great school for their kids, but also supplement that with out of school educational activities. So you're talking to a former teacher as well, 24 years, mom, oh, sister, brother, sons, uh, all, all teachers, former teachers. So this is a popular program. So we looked at states that currently do not have an ESA program. What we discovered, 70% in those states 
um, want them, 70% of parents. And among those 70%, 64% said that they would apply and apply immediately. Um, what's that tell you? I think it tells us that these programs are incredibly popular. And I think one of the key findings from that was, you know, we were serving, or excuse me, you, you were surveying very different states that did not have ESA. So that was looking at, you know, a state like Alabama, California, Pennsylvania, three very different states. And in all of those, over 70% of parents said that they want the ESAs to be made available in those states. And so I think what that shows me is that these policies are very popular across state lines. Um, they're very popular, we also saw, with different um, racial groups, um, different demographic groups, because once you dig into the poll numbers, um, it shows that, you know, both Hispanic, Black, white, and Asians support these overwhelmingly. And so I think that there is an incredible amount of support for these policies. And politicians and state leaders across the country should really be taking a very close look at these as a policy solution for some of the issues that we've discussed, such as childhood poverty, uh, learning gaps, COVID learning loss, because these are very popular. Well, you know, it's interesting to me, 70%, when, I, when a pollster sees a number like that, that's consensus, basically. Mm -hmm. But you just, you, you mentioned three states, Alabama, red, Pennsylvania, purple, California, blue. So in this era of hyper uh, uh, tension, you know, and, and hyper partisanship, this appears to be, hey, 70 plus percent. Th this appears to be something that everybody kind of agrees with. Um, right. Yeah. And, and they also want it fast and they want it now. 80 percent of the parents in all nine states want a technology that approves the application process in seconds. And then 77% want a direct deposit immediately. And you're saying at, at Odyssey that that's very possible. That's right. So designing good ESA policy is only half the battle. The other half of it is implementing it in a way that makes it easy for parents to sign up, be approved and access the funds. And so our mission at Odyssey is to grow these programs to all parents across the states that we work in who want to access them. And so the way that we do that is really design the technology that powers these programs to be as simple as possible. And so our technology can be swiftly deployed. We've been able to deploy in several weeks um, when there's a quick turnaround. And then we are a company that offers the only real-time identity verification solution, which means that as parents apply, they find out their status in typically under one second, which is a very stark departure from what the industry standard has been nationwide, which typically takes about 30 to 60 days. And by confirming eligibility faster, it means the parents are able to get an answer faster and they're able to get access to their funds faster. And that's a huge win for parents um, across the country in, in the states that we work in. So what's next for Odyssey as this campaign sweeps the country? Absolutely. So we want to be supportive um, in states that are trying out ESAs for the very first time. So we're looking to expand to those states that are uh, have passed ESAs and are rolling them out for the first time, that are looking to pass them. We're also looking to improve all of the services that we currently offer in the states that we serve. Um, and I think that, you know, over the course of the next few years, you'll see these um, programs continue to grow and expand. And we want to grow and expand along with them. So, uh, folks, those of you who are viewing um, down at the bottom of the screen throughout this interview has been uh, the Odyssey website. Um, I assume, Joe, that going to the Odyssey website will answer any questions that folks might have, allow them yes. to get a little more granular. What would you like as a final parting shot? What would you like our viewers and listeners to know? I would just say that um, 
you know, if you want to find out more information about Odyssey, please visit the site. Um, you can also find me on Twitter at Joseph J. Connor, uh, occasionally tweet there. But I think the most important thing is that um, we do have policy solutions and education that work. We have massive problems, as we discussed earlier, but ESAs should be one policy solution that state governments in all 50 states should be looking at seriously based on the results of these polls, which show, as we said, that there really is a consensus that parents like and support these programs. And so my um, two cents is that everyone who's serious about fixing education should take a serious look at ESAs. And I would only close by suggesting, because I have followed education for years, that we're really not talking about much new money here. States spend a fortune, and Sorry. frankly, they waste a fortune uh, on education. $1,500 for parents that apply and approved, on one hand, is not a big ticket item for the state. On the other hand, parents can get very creative with that $1,500. It can be used very wisely. Joe, it's been a pleasure working with you and a pleasure learning more of, about Odyssey and uh, about this program. Good luck with it. And thanks for showing up this week. Thanks so much, John. I appreciate you having me on. Thanks. Once again, thank you folks for uh, listening and for watching. We're going to do our best to keep you informed, especially the kind of work that we've been doing for a variety of clients, as well as our weekly thoughts on the, the news of the world. Thank you, see you next week.